Okay, greetings. Thank you for joining me. This is my presentation on striving for environmental sustainability and uh, with socioeconomic exclusion in ecotourism. My name is Peter Varga. I work for Ecole Hotelier de Lausanne in Switzerland. This is the University of Applied Sciences in Hospitality and Tourism. So I'd like to take you to Latin America, particularly to Ecuador this time, the country which is very often characterized as a destination for ecotourism, all along with uh, some other countries such as Kenya, Tanzania or Costa Rica. And I would like to talk a little bit about uh, one specific case in uh, a national park, which is called the Cuyabano Wildlife Reserve. A very interesting hotspot as far as environmental criteria are concerned. And of course, we find there are some ethnic groups. And I have been interested in one of these ethnic groups, which is called the Siona people. So um, in this presentation, I would like to talk a little bit about the tourism in Ecuador, tourism in the Cuyabano Wildlife Reserve. A little bit about the Siona people and after I would like to uh, tell you what kind of methodology I choose to understand tourism dynamics and changes not necessarily caused by only the tourism but changes in general in the society and uh, highlight some findings and eventual scenario for the future. So if you see Ecuador, Ecuador is here, right here. Uh, of course, the country and the area, what I'm talking about, is in the northern part of Ecuador, very close to Colombia. This is an area, of course, um, in the Amazonian rainforest, the primary jungle. And um, very often, when we speak about the primary jungle, of course, it shows a kind of adventurous trip when we are talking about from a tourism perspective. And uh, when people go to this area, of course, they are looking for adventure, nature, and a little bit of culture as well. Ecuador is surrounded by Colombia and Peru in the other side. These are the people. These are the Siona people whom you see here. And as you see, we can already have some interesting uh, conclusions and ideas about their authenticity because when we see the clothes that they have here, of course, these clothes, uh, uh, they don't, it, it doesn't come from, uh, from their traditional culture, it was left from the missionaries who were very active in previous centuries in the area, but after they left and they just uh, developed a certain very specific culture by their own. Uh, when we speak about the tourism in the country itself, as a large, we can say that Ecuador attracts more or less one million international tourist arrivals. And um, as a destination, most of the people, when they think about Ecuador, they speak about, uh, they think about um, the Galapagos Islands, of course. But besides the Galapagos Islands, uh, the country has quite a few other interesting tourist destinations, such as uh, the Cuyabano Wildlife Reserve, which became a national park protected area in 1979, in, a, in an area more or less 600,000 hectares. And if you see the number of tourists who arrived to this area between 1984 and 2010, in this case, this is the latest data I could have, uh, it's a huge change. In 2010, we speak about 9,000 tourists. Of course, it's not that big if you compare it to the mass tourist destinations such as the Galapagos Islands, but still, for a small community such as the Siona, who are not more than 160 people in this area, uh, definitely it's an important change. So just to highlight some of these changes, not necessarily coming from the tourism, this is what you see here on the top. This is a traditional Siena home. What you see here on the bottom, this is a Siena home, what we have these days in the area. This means important changes, not only as far as the structure is concerned, but as far as the size is concerned. You see here, a family was living together. Here, families are separated eventually. But if we go back to the idea of how tourism has been influencing this uh, community in the area, I would like to show you and talk a little bit about my research question and why I formed this research question. Uh, I have been uh, working in the area since the 1990s. So what I'm doing with this uh, research is a long lasting research and I try to understand what changes have been taking place in the area since the second part of the 1990s till today. So my question is, the main idea is, how do environmental sustainability and religious revitalization influence tourism dynamics in the Cuyabano Wildlife, Wildlife Reserve? The methodology I chose to understand this is qualitative method. 
of course, it's a series of different methods. First of all, the ethnographic field work, because uh, I believe this is the best way to understand the emic point of view, the emic point of view, which is the, the locals' perception of tourism. I spent uh, quite a long time in the area since the second part of the 90s. Uh, last year, I had the chance to return as well. Also, the participant observation is another methodology, uh, staying in the community and observing what is going on. I also conducted semi structure interviews through thematic analysis. And of course, I made some quantitative and uh, a little bit qualitative questionnaires as well. But I'm still waiting for some, some results. So the results I'm presenting here, they are still uh, changing at the moment. But I think the outcomes are very, very interesting. The major area of interest of this research is um, I, first of all, I wanted to understand what are the ethno-historical uh, details we should know about these people. Because I do believe that when we want to work with people who have been living isolated in the past, uh, far from, let's say, the modern or postmodern world and societies, I do believe that we have to understand their past because otherwise imposing certain ideas and concepts might not be very successful. In this case, the tourism, uh, something which is relatively new. It started, as I told you, mainly in the 1980s, but more importantly in the second part of the 1990s. I also wanted to understand how the traditional and the current social structure of these people are handling this phenomenon, which is called tourism. As I mentioned, the emic and ethic perception in tourism are very important. The emic perception is about the locals, how the locals think and perceive tourism. The ethic perception, I would say those who are not living in the area, tour operators, tourism, Ministry of Tourism, and ONGs, and some other stakeholders in the area. So I made interviews with them, and I analyzed them accordingly. When we speak about tourism versus traditional subsistence, very often when we speak about ecotourism in this case, because Ecuador is promoting an ecotourism as an ecotourism destination, we have to see that uh, when there is a complete dependence on tourism, very often it's very dangerous. And this is the case with ecotourism as well. We all know from, a, let's say, experience and from ac academic literature that when we depend on exclusively on tourism or ecotourism, it can be very fragile and very dangerous for the locals. Because imagine a situation when, uh, for example, 9-11, what happened? Everybody stopped traveling. So it can be really dangerous for some communities or even countries when we depend on exclusively on tourism. I was also interested in whether the tourism is led by internal or external actors. Because uh, when you speak about the external-led tourism development through commodification, we know that very often this is a major problem. We talk about empowerment, we talk about how to make a more uh, internal control of the tourism dynamics in a given area. Often this is a serious problem. So I wanted to understand what kind of tourism development passed in this area. And um, I wanted to understand how the locals participate in this tourism. Environmental versus social sustainability, this is in the title, because um, I will show you some photos in the next few slides, which shows that actually the tourism infrastructure in the area is becoming more and more luxurious, which means that in the 1990s, they had very basic camps and very basic installations. Today, we speak about almost luxurious uh, camps uh, with bathrooms, with hot water, with solar panels. So I wanted to understand how the environment of sustainability, which is mainly directed by external actors, tour operators, Ministry of Tourism, they, um, how this environmental sustainability is influencing the social sustainability in the area. Because there are some hints, and through my interviews and observation, I saw and I could detect that uh, the social sustainability is neglected in this development. Last but not least, when we speak about the evangelism versus cultural revitalization. This is a very interesting subject because I will highlight in the next few minutes that um, social structure has been widely discussed 
in the last few years. And um, evangelism or evangelist groups are entering the area and they're changing the belief system. They change the, the community feelings in, in this area because evangelists, they are actually against traditional cultural elements such as shamanism or such as drinking some hallucinogenic plants like the yahe. And it seems to be that it can be a potential benefit for the locals or it can be a danger for the future because when we speak about externally led belief system in an area, of course, uh, we will see the impacts and what kind of impacts uh, it can have in the community. I, as I mentioned uh, previously, these are some photos. The first one, what you see here, is a tourist camp in the Cuyabin Wildlife Resort in 1996, which also shows us that uh, it was very basic. As I said, only mosquito nets, you see some very basic installations, not very fancy. When we talk about today, 2013, you see that these tour operators who own these installations, the land is owned by the Siona people, the local native indigenous people, but the installation is owned by the tour operators, it's becoming more and more luxurious. So this striving for luxury eventually has an interesting impact on the social economic dimensions and participation of the locals in tourism. If you see the next photo, the first one, here, for example, you see the solar panel. That's also a new installation. So basically, the basic camps have been transformed to sustainable campsite with hot water, electricity, and of course, when we speak about some Western values like more and more alcoholic beverages. And when we speak about the staff who work here, if you see this, most of these people are not from the area. These are people coming from other parts of the country, which means that the participation of the locals is being more and more decreased. The next photo indicates also how the local uh, constructions don't respect this uh, very high installation. They don't respect the local uh, infrastructure and the local style because, of course, the local indigenous people didn't live in these kind of installations. If you see the rooms now, and comparing to the first photo I showed you with the mosquito net only, you see that this is becoming something very fancy. And the last photo, I took it last year in the area in 2012, uh, you see that uh, in the jungle now we are selecting the garbage. What is interesting in this, that uh, if you see this, of course, it's something very fascinating and we are more and more used to select our own leftovers, uh, plastic, uh, glass, and, uh, and recyclable materials. But in the rainforest, what is interesting is that they are not allowed, uh, these two operators, to, to put on the ground or burn these materials. So they have to take them back to the cities, where we all know that there is no any recycling plant. So we are taking these garbages back to the city, and at the same time, we know that in the city they will be thrown into the river or used in another way. Definitely, it is not recyclable. Why is it like that? Because there is a new actor, a new, let's say, stakeholder in this area. This new stakeholder is called Rainforest Alliance. This is a foreign-based, it's a foreign-based uh, NGO, and they are providing certification, eco-labels and certification, verifications of the tourist, tourist installations, basically the campsite. And they require these kind of selecting materials and selecting the leftover materials in the area. So this is a new stakeholder. But if you see the other stakeholders, we own, for example, Let's see, there are the Siona people, the locals, the Ministry of Tourism, the tourists themselves, the tour operators, Rainforest Alliance, petrol companies, because there is a lot of petrol in this area. And you know, Ecuador is a developing country. They need this natural resource. The colons, who are people coming from other parts of the country, because they are looking for agricultural lands. So they are, dis they are destroying the forests, so cutting the trees, and they are looking for land for their own agriculture. And some evangelists who are also engaged. 
But if we see these different uh, actors, they are having serious conflicts within each other. The Sionas, of course, are in conflict with the Colons because they are uh, occupying more and more indigenous land. When we speak about the 1950s, 1960s, there were not more than 40, 50,000 Colons in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Today, we speak about over 500,000 Colons who came because of the agricultural land available in the area. Secondly, because of the petrol companies that are recruiting people. And of course, these Colons are entering more and more into the rainforest and where these native indigenous people are living. When we speak about other conflicts, such as Sionas against petrol companies, let's not talk about too much about the pollution in this area. Petrol, gas, and toxic materials are very often in the river, unfortunately, causing, of course, serious problems for the Siona people because they use the water from the rivers. Sionas against the Ministry of Tourism, it's mainly because of the lack of control. Uh, recently, they just simply cancelled the entrance fee to the national park, which was actually used for controlling the area. The Ministry of Tourism is not giving a sufficient framework for an optimal management in the area. When you speak about petrol companies, tour operators, when you speak about the object uh, and the reason why tourists go to this area, of course, it's mainly the nature, culture as well. But if the nature is being destroyed, in this case, the tour operators will have less uh, tourists visiting the area. Of course, tour operators, Ministry of Tourism, also kind of lack of control. Various tour operators without proper license, they enter the area and they are operating without uh, lots of attention to nature and culture. Let's speak about Ministry of Tourism and Colognes, of course, the illegal colonization endangering certain ecosystem in the area already. When I speak about tour operators and Colognes, somehow it is very similar because if the Colognes are destroying, destroying the nature and they are polluting eventually or cutting trees or killing the animals, there are less interest for the tourists left in the rainforest. Tour operators and evangelist groups, mainly because, as I said, the evangelist groups, they are trying to change certain elements in the traditional culture, which also means that uh, those who are still working a little bit in the tourism, they are eventually losing certain culture traditions or they are not presenting it for the tourists, such as the shamanism, uh, because the evangelists who are against these uh, culture manifestations. And uh, I mentioned the Rainforest Alliance, and just to give you an interesting detail, Rainforest Alliance is verifying and certifying camps in the area. It needs a lot of uh, investment. It costs more or less $10,000 to have a camp uh, certified. And uh, what is interesting, that uh, there hasn't been any study which shows that the certification eventually will be beneficial for those tour operators who are requiring this certification. So there is no study which would show that this certification would attract more tourists into the area. That's an interesting. Of course, the locals, they are not very much, they are not included at all in this certification program. And that's why I have some interesting findings and possible scenarios to share with you. First of all, after a long time in the area, after all these methodological uh, uh, tools, um, I could detect that there is a very serious incompatibility of indigenous social structure with ecotourism. To explain me shortly, in order to work well in ecotourism, tour operators, they need an, a community arrangement and agreement that would host the tourists in the area. The problem with this is that the traditional social structure of the Siona is something that is based on the family unit. So people, they look for the benefit of their own families. They are not very much interested in what's happening with the other families. They don't have the community feeling. So if you don't have the community feeling, they are not really willing to work as united community with travel agents, tour operators, or even with the Ministry of Tourism. This also means that this incompatibility will create more and more segregation and inequalities in the local structure. Some families will profit more out of the tourism, those who have the land to give or to lend it for the, for the tour operators to build these tourist infrastructures, like these uh, cabanas or hotels. Those will have a relatively important income 
But those who don't have this possibility to work a little bit with the tool operators, of course, individual families, they will have serious uh, discrimination as far as their economic incomes are com concerned because they will have to live on very traditional subsistence like agriculture, and it is very, very poorly remunerated in the area. So there is an incompatibility. My message is that when we want to do an ecotourism or tourism project with some indigenous or native people, it is always advisable to, to study the, the social structure, history, the ethno-history of these people in order to identify how we can approach these uh, families or communities or these societies. Second interesting finding is there is a religious revitalization toward unification, which is um, an interesting concept uh, detected only last year, because as I said, the evangelists are in the, in the area. And um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there were not more than four or five native indigenous Siona who joined the religious uh, to the evangelist group. Last year, I counted over 40 Siona who are in the evangelist group, which also means that in order to be in this evangelist uh, group, there's a church actually in the, in the reserve, a very, very small and very basic church with four walls and the roof on it. These people, they have to, those evangelists who are in this church, in the Siona, Siona society, they have to change certain aspects of their lives. They have to, for example, work harder, they have to be very disciplined, they have to avoid alcoholic beverages, and they have to, be, they have, to have a very restricted lifestyle. Which also means that eventually, if they join to this religious group, they could create, and this is a little bit uh, possible these days, they could create a better and more united community feeling in the, com in the, in the area. So if they have a better community feeling, eventually tourism dynamics and profits uh, for the local community in this case would be more important. So eventually there could be a religious revitalization, but this religious re revitalization coming from an external actor, stakeholder, which is the evangelist pastor. So it can be a positive for the community. On the other hand, when we speak about uh, evangelism, we all know that they are very strict as far as other religious as religions are concerned. For example, uh, after talking to the evangelist pastor, he said that he doesn't agree with uh, shamanism, so he doesn't uh, accept that somebody who is in his religious community among the evangelists practices shamanism or drinking this hallucinogenic plant, uh, yahe, which was widely practiced in this area. So, it can be positive, but it can be also negative, because in this case, if we are restricting, they are restricting the, the traditional cultural rituals, then of course, uh, there's a very important change in the local society. Third um, finding is that uh, enhanced socioeconomic exclusion and further social disintegration in host population is very possible, and it's actually taking place and mainly because of sustainable efforts. When you speak about sustainability, and particularly environmental sustainability, out of the three major pillars, you know, environmental, social, and economic sustainability, when we speak about the environmental sustainability, as far as the camps are concerned, the tourist infrastructure is concerned, as you said, as you saw, it's becoming more and more luxurious. It also means that the service that they are providing to the tourist is becoming more and more say, disciplined, more and more detailed, and they are really looking for more and more quality service. The issue here is that those Siona who are living in this area, most of them have a very basic formal education system. They pass the very basic formal education system, which means that many of them have difficulties to read, write, they don't communicate in English, and they don't necessarily have the same values as in, let's say, say, Western societies, punctuality, hard work, reliability. Imagine a situation when, uh, when the tourist group is, is expecting uh, and, and wants to leave for, uh, for a walk in the rainforest, and uh, the local guide, if there is a local guide, is late by one or two hours, 
of course, these uh, two operators that are very much uh, in, are very much interested in details and quality services, they are becoming less and less tolerant in front of these negligences. So because of this environmental initiatives from the tour operator, it seems to be there is a very important socioeconomic exclusion in the local community and less and less people work on the tourism. In the 1990s, I could detect that people were working as tour guides, native tour guides, cooks, or canoe drivers, uh, maintaining the, the tourism, tourist infrastructure like these cabanas. But today, when I, when I returned last year in 2012, I hardly saw any native guide. I hardly saw any, anyone who was working as a cook. I hardly saw anybody in these camps. Everybody was coming from outside of the reserve. They were non-native people. They were coming from big cities like Quito, Guayaquil, or Manta, and Lago Agrio, which is very close to the area. And the last uh, issue, what I would like to highlight here, is uh, that a scenario which can be interesting uh, is that, uh, you know, Ecuador is a country which a developing country which needs its natural resources, which is petrol in this case, and wood in the rainforest. So uh, if uh, ecotourism and if um, the Siona people cannot show that tourism is, a, is an important activity in the area, they will lose probably interest of, from political actors. And there is a big chance that the national economic interest, in this case oil and wood, will lead to more environmental degradation and the depreciation of tourism. Because uh, if it is not well managed and visibly locals are playing less and less important role and additionally there is no increase in tourism revenues, in this case the government and political leaders they will eventually reevaluate the tourism dynamics of the area and they will favor the exploitation of oil and wood in the area is very beneficial for the country.